Reezy Resell. Follow the hustle. TLA says, I'm having trouble price comparing while scanning apps. What apps or app do I use to check the average price of items? So the average price is not something you really want to check. What you want to check is what the current price is and the velocity of sales. And you do that by seeing what the lowest price is currently on Amazon for the buy box and also looking at the best sellers rank. You have to understand that sales rank or best seller rank on Amazon, it's not static, it's dynamic, it moves. So when stuff doesn't sell, the rank gets worse. When things do sell, the rank gets better. And you can see that on a graph using Keepa. Different scanning apps have that built in, whether you're using Scout IQ, Scoutly, Seller Amp, Scoutify 2. Many different apps can all do the things that you need. You just need to figure out which one fits into what you're doing. But to be honest, you can do it with the Amazon seller app. You're just not gonna have access to all of the granular data that makes it easier to make a decision quickly. It would be in your benefit to have a little chart on you that would tell you what's the top 10%, the top 5%, the top 1% of items in that category. So if you wanna get that chart emailed to you every month, go to my website, reseresells.com, and one of the little resources links in the top you can click on and it says sales rank charts, click on that, put your email in, and I send you every month a new updated sales rank chart. It's formatted like to be vertical, so you could make it your lock screen on your phone. That way when you're sourcing, you just tap your power button real quick, boom, you see the sales rank chart and you know if you're in the vicinity of the good rank for that category. Once you figure it out and you get accustomed to it, you'll reference that less, but your best bet is to just look at the Keepa chart. Keepa's not free. It's like $20. The reason I say like $20 is because it's a European company and it's 18 pounds. So depending on whatever the conversion rate is. SMOS23 says, how hard is it to get a wholesaler's license? It's very easy. And you don't need a wholesaler's license. You just need to get your business paperwork in line, either having an LLC or a DBA. That way, when you go to make an account with a wholesale supplier, you're not just saying, hey, I'm I'm Reezy McReezyton and I need a wholesale account. Will you sell me some stuff? Because that doesn't look good. You want to be like Reezy Incorporated, Reezy Distributing Inc. Once you get that and you get registered with your state, now you have your seller's permit. That allows you to purchase stuff without paying sales tax. Since you're gonna charge sales tax to your customers, you're not paying it when you buy stuff. When you got those things, then you just apply with wholesalers, boom, get an account. At least if they're accepting new accounts, look for on Google for suppliers of what you wanna source. And the ones that are advertising, they're very likely to be accepting new clients to purchase from them because they're already spending money to acquire new clients running ads, right? So that kind of is an indicator that they're ready to add some more people to the list. Kev910 says, man, you really got me wanting to move forward, but my confidence is not that strong. Check it out. You can start slow and bootstrap it. You don't need to buy courses. What you need to do is buy your confidence through repetition and practice. You're gonna fail a lot and that's how you learn. That's okay, everybody does that. But you wanna fail cheaply. So don't get in over your head because if you're already at a loss for confidence and then you get in over your head and you fail, that might be the straw that broke the camel's back and you might never ever get back in the game again. So take it slow start with used stuff, start doing retail arbitrage very slowly, you know, successfully pull yourself out of the matrix from the nine to five and change your life and be on to, you know, bigger and better things. I've seen many people do it who started with $0 or $5 like myself. If anybody that's remotely similar to you has done it, you can do it too. And that's how you really need to approach the situation. Just understand that you're gonna fail and you're gonna have setbacks, but what makes you a winner in the long term is not getting crushed by your setbacks and just, you know, rolling with the punches and keep going forward. You can do it, bro. Chrissy says, can I source from Sam's Club and what products? You could buy anything from Sam's Club. Doesn't mean it's gonna sell on Amazon. Honestly, if I knew a product that I could tell you to buy from Sam's Club to flip right now, I wouldn't tell you because that's not gonna teach you anything. I want you to learn how to find your own products and then sell them. And when you find those products, don't share them with anybody because those are your babies and you wanna keep selling them as long as you can until it's not profitable anymore. Now, when you find a product at a regular store that you can sell for a premium price on Amazon and you can keep selling it and when it sells out, you can go back and buy more from Sam's Club and sell them again. We call that a replenishable and you wanna keep those close to your chest. You do not wanna share those with anybody 
I don't mean any disrespect, but I try to teach people how to fish versus giving them fish. And also the other thing is that there's other resellers who are already in the game. They have skin in the game. They've put that work up. And if I give away something like that for free on my YouTube channel and then 150 people go out and buy it and sell it on Amazon to make a quick buck, these are people that are maybe and most likely not going to continue selling on Amazon. And I might have just really hurt one or two or a dozen resellers who are making good money with that product already. And they got there, you know what I mean, through their hard work. So it's not fair to the people that already put the work in and have skin in the game. And it's also not fair to you because it doesn't teach you anything. Can I open an Amazon seller account? I can't access the old one because of two-way verification and old phone. This is a weird technical issue. And uh, as technical as I am, I don't really know the answer to this exactly, but I do believe that you can get it figured out. It's very hard to contact Amazon seller support. It's really automated and really just like a dead end but you might have some luck reaching out to Amazon seller support on Twitter. They actually made a Amazon seller support Twitter account in the last year and they're fairly active on there. So go bug them, tag them, DM them, and you might have some luck. Otherwise just keep calling and keep emailing until you can get it figured out. If you need to make a new Amazon account, do not make one with your name because you only get one. So if you make another one, They'll probably close both of them instantly unless you ask for permission to make a second account with Amazon. BT says, how do you quickly determine what the shipping cost estimate will be when scanning with the Amazon seller app? So you need to be somewhat in touch with the shipping rates. This is why it can help to use a scanning app like Scoutify2 or Scoutly or Scout IQ or one of those seller amps, something like that, because they let you put in a shipping rate per pound and then when you scan it, it references the product weight, which is in the Amazon database, and then it estimates the shipping out from there. A quick way that you can figure it out, and it's not the quickest way, but pirateship.com is a completely free website. When you're not printing postage from the platform that you sold the item on, you should be printing postage from pirateship.com. You don't get free postage. You still have to pay for that, but otherwise it's completely free. If you classically overpay for shipping, you're probably not using pirate ship. And that is a good way to get the actual weight and the actual cost of the postage so that you can then put that into Amazon. It also helps just to know like, oh, I'm going to be able to throw this in a priority mailer. You could also calculate shipping on the USPS website as well. It gets faster once you get more in touch with shipping. Traveler Gateway says, if I'm out of the USA, how do I start? So first off, you could sell on the Amazon platform wherever you live. And you're actually pretty blessed if you sell in EU, you send it to the EU Amazon warehouse, the one in your country or whatever, and it's available in a bunch of different countries automatically. In America, we just have America and we have to do global export to get it to go to Mexico and Canada and it's kind of a hassle. But Americans do buy way more than anybody on Amazon. So it's in your best interest to sell in America and plenty of sellers who live in Canada sell in America as well. So obviously you can do private label. You get your products from China, they're shipped directly to Amazon, stored by Amazon FBA, and then sold to your customers on the dot-com platform. But you can also do wholesale and online arbitrage. You order it from Kohl's, it goes straight to your third-party prep company. They process it, bag it, make sure it's not damaged, the boxes, everything's good. Then they send it to your Amazon FBA account for you. Then American.com customers purchase it and you get paid. So you will never touch a product and you will just be managing the products, the inventory, the pricing, the customer service from afar. But I do know a lot of Americans that sell in the UK. So if Americans can sell in the UK from America, you can do the same from anywhere. Shout out Gumpify said, I just sent my first shipment of books in a couple of weeks ago and I got my first few sales under my belt. Awesome, awesome. So be careful with the restock limits. It's not unlimited like it used to be. They recently updated it, so it's not a numeric limit. It's now a volume limit, which is great for books, CDs, and DVDs because they're smaller. When it was based on how many units you could send in, that kind of sucked because someone who sold, you know, Squishmallows as big as a table would get the same amount of units as someone who sells a book. But just be careful with it. Don't send anything in that you don't expect to sell within three 
to six months and preferably three. So what that equates to is when you're looking at your scanner on Scout IQ or Scoutly, you wanna make sure that e-score is like 10 or 20. If it's not 10 or 20, you shouldn't be sending it into FBA. Now that doesn't mean that it won't sell and it's not profitable. It just means that you should store it locally and when it sells, you should ship it to the customer. If you go too hard, you send in too much stuff, it doesn't sell fast enough, you're gonna fill up all your space and then you won't be able to send stuff in and now Amazon's updating the removal fees, so it's gonna cost almost $12 to remove an item that would have previously cost like 75 cents to $1.50 max. If you're gonna sell books or media, CDs and DVDs, Merchant Fulfilled is definitely gonna be part of your solution. I find it hard to believe that anybody's gonna make a living selling books, CDs or DVDs and only doing FBA. Another important question, do I need a thermal printer? The four inches I saw were around 200 to 300 bucks. You don't need a thermal printer, but it does make your life extremely easier. You can print on a regular inkjet or laser printer and then just cut the postage label and tape it onto the box. Don't wrinkle the tape over the barcode, right? Or else they won't be able to scan it. At some point, you're gonna get extremely sick of that and it's so nice to just label comes out, peel it off, slap it on the box. Like as soon as you get a label printer, you'll be like, man, I should have got one of those a long time ago. But if you're bootstrapping and you're starting from nothing like I did, I'd rather you save that $100, $200, $300, or whatever the price is for the thermal printer and spend it on inventory that you can flip and turn into profit. If you do get a thermal printer, I highly recommend the Rolo brand printers, but you can also find some old school Zebra printers, Eltron, Orion, as long as it has a USB hookup, even if they're so old that they don't have USB, they have parallel port, you can make it work, right? So there's a multitude of different thermal printers you could use. Just do not buy the Dymo brand thermal printers at all. It's a terrible design. They jam and you'll want to take a hammer to it and you don't want to feel like you want to take a hammer to the thing that you just bought for 200 bucks. So can Amazon ask randomly to show invoice otherwise suspend you? Let's say you got ungated for Nike by Kohl's invoice and then you buy and sell from somewhere else. Can you get in trouble? Thank you. No, you cannot get in trouble. I've never heard of anything like this happening at all. So once you get ungated, you're in the game. What might happen and could happen is you could get a customer claim as used, sold as new or as inauthentic, basically counterfeit. Those receipts from retail stores will always save you from inauthentic claims and from used, sold as new. So make sure you always, always, always save the receipts. And in cases of purchasing items from like Ross, Marshalls or TJ Maxx or Home Goods or any store like that, where they don't say on the receipt exactly what the item is, there's always gonna be like a long trailing number after the item on the receipt. And that number matches the barcode on the price tag in the store. So like when they scan the price tag on the shoes, that's how the computer knows to charge you that price and also knows that it's from the men's department. But because your receipt won't actually say Nike Air Max shoes, you need to take a picture of the brand new product with the packaging. I like to just have the box out with the label facing out and set the shoes right on the box with the Marshalls tag flipped forward clearly. So you can just take one picture real quick that will show here's the brand new packaging and then there's the price tag from the supplier and the number on the price tag matches the number on the receipt. What's a better business to get into, Amazon or doing Shopify drop shipping as a beginner? Amazon. Drop shipping is crap. Anybody that tells you that drop shipping is the way to go is a straight scam artist. Very, very little people are making any money doing drop shipping. And if they are, it's maybe 10% of all the money they're making selling on other platforms. Or, you know, they live at home, so they don't have bills, they don't have kids, they don't have car payments. Or maybe they just hit a lick on a very popular trending item. Or maybe they're just like experts at spotting trends. I'm sure there are some people that are just crushing it with drop shipping, but they're probably marketing it in very creative ways through a Shopify store and their ads are targeted very well and they're popping up on your story on Instagram and getting you to swipe up and buy that thing for $20 and they're getting them for seven. It's not impossible. I'm just saying in 15 years plus of selling online, I have never once met a person feeding their family off of drop shipping. So I don't really recommend you pursue that.
How do I turn my personal Amazon seller account into an LLC with a new tax EIN? I would just go to Google and type sell on Amazon. It's actually sell.amazon.com, which is become an Amazon seller. Start selling with Amazon now and then sign in or you click sign up and you'll use your regular information. But be careful because it says sign up $39.99 a month plus selling fees. You can actually under the pricing drop down menu, click compare selling plans. And then there is something called the individual selling plan, which is free. If you don't click compare pricing, that's the only place to find the sign up for individual seller plan link. Otherwise, they make it seem like the only way you can sell on Amazon is for $39.99 a month. So the difference is, is that with the free plan, the individual seller, they charge you an additional dollar for every item that you sell. So as soon as you sell 40 items a month or more, you should upgrade to the professional plan. The other main difference is that as an individual seller, you'll be unable to apply in restricted categories. So if you want to start, you know, getting ungated in brands like Nike, Adidas, or whatever stuff you're finding that you're unable to sell, unfortunately, you'll have to be the professional seller, which does cost $40 a month. But the good news is, is that if you're selling other things like books or stuff where you don't need to get ungated in, you can be fine with that individual seller plan and save that $40 a month for inventory. But remember to upgrade as soon as you sell 40 items a month or more on average, or you're going to be throwing money away. That brings me to a side note, guys, be very, very careful getting into this Amazon business. Everybody is trying to sell you something. You should not be investing in products that are costing money to make money when you're not making money yet. You can upgrade one piece at a time and you'll know when it's time to upgrade because that service or that tool or whatever it is, it makes your life easier. And A, you either get your time back and you can do whatever you want with it or you can use it to make more money or it's helping you make more money directly, something like pricing or whatever. Just don't, don't do it the hard way way longer than you should because that might be holding you back. Nerds Reselling and Picking says, if you're sourcing stuff from garage sales, thrifting like used books or stuff without UPCs, what happens if Amazon requests an invoice or they only invoice you if you are selling product as new? So for the most part, Amazon is not gonna request an invoice, but in a very rare situation, a customer can report something as used, sold as new or counterfeit. And if you're selling used items that you got from garage sales or thrift stores, you just do not have a way to prove that it is was actually new or that it was authentic. So that's a tricky thing. It might be brand new sealed at the thrift store, but you can't prove that it was brand new sealed from the thrift store because you don't have a retail receipt from an authorized supplier that matches that, right? Even if you have the picture of the product brand new, it is a risk that you take, but it is highly unlikely. I only know of like one person in over 15 years that got in trouble for selling used books because they got a counterfeit claim and they couldn't prove that it wasn't counterfeit. It's just not very likely to happen. If you sell used textbooks, that's a different ball game because textbooks are actually very often counterfeited and they're so hard to tell if it's counterfeit or not. Like if you only have one copy of a textbook, you don't know if it's counterfeit or not. Almost nobody does, not even the publisher of the company. But if you have two copies from two different people, it starts to get a little bit easier. For that reason, when you're doing online arbitrage of textbooks, I recommend don't buy less than three because you want three copies, preferably from different people. The thing with it also is that the textbook publishers hired these law firms to basically go after third-party sellers so that they can get us out of business so that there's less copies available so that people will buy the new books because the used books are like higher price. You know what I mean? Less supply means a higher price on Amazon for the used copy, which means kids are more likely to get the new book because it's not that much more than the used copy. But there is actually a decent amount of counterfeits. And if you make enough money selling textbooks on Amazon, they are just going to clap you up. That's how it goes. This is an easy one for me to answer. Elicit says, Reezy, what category should a beginner start in? You should start in used books. It's by far the easiest category to sell in. Books are easy to list. They're easy to find. They're easy to ship. They're small and they're cheap, right? So when you make a mistake, it doesn't cost you very much. Aside from books, you can also do CDs, not popular CDs, unfortunately but you can sell a good amount of CDs. You should also start with the stuff you have in your house already. So I have this thing I call shop your house. 
And that basically means learn how to use the Amazon seller app to see if things are profitable to sell or not. Then you go and scan all the stuff in your house that you don't need anymore. And I'm not talking just Amazon. I think if you're just getting started, you should try every platform, specifically Amazon and eBay. If you're doing a lot of clothing, maybe you're going to focus on Poshmark. Maybe you're going to look into Depop. Maybe you're going to cross list it on different platforms. And the reason I say that is because I know you're here to hear me talk about Amazon, but a lot of you guys really just have a nine to five job and want to learn how to make money online. And Amazon might not be the best for you because part of making this thing work is not only figuring it out, but like sticking in the game long enough that you figure it out. And usually what I've found is that people who enjoy what they're doing, or at least the category that they're working in, have a better time, it's easier for them. So like a lot of women do clothing. You're not gonna do much used clothing on Amazon. And everybody has a closet full of clothes, especially women. I'm not trying to stereotype you ladies, but I know plenty of women who have bankrolled their reselling career by selling the things in their own closet. So I don't know if you guys know who Monica Gamboa is, the posh hanger. She started by selling her clothing in her closet after she quit her job. She had some business suits and some other things and you'd be surprised. Like even if you don't want to sell the clothing that you have, why don't you just list it and put like a crazy price on it to where if it did sell for that price, you'd be happy to let it go. Oscar says, hey, Reezy, I've heard that if you purchase brand names from Kohl's, you can get ungated. What is your advice on that? Yes, it can work, but you're going to have to purchase online, not in store. The key is that eight and a half by 11 receipt, right? That sometimes actually says invoice, which you can get from almost anywhere in the pandemic when everyone was selling Logitech webcams and I wanted to get ungated so I could sell Logitech webcams because I was gated. I bought 10 units of a webcam privacy cover off of logitech.com. They're like 99 cents. I submitted my invoice and I got ungated. So it didn't used to be that easy guys, but nowadays you can pretty much just order from the supplier direct and get approved with that. You might have to change your Amazon information to match the invoice because those things need to match up depending on what you have your information on Amazon set as. And if you submit it and it doesn't get approved, don't worry, just keep submitting it. Close that case or let it be, make a new case and resubmit it again. Oftentimes it takes 10 to 20 times to submit your invoice before you get approved because Amazon's system is entirely automated. You just need to be persistent. I've been approved by submitting a blank piece of paper before. Don't worry about it. You're going to get it. Crystal says, I hate to leave the house and I don't have time to go shop in a store. And when I go in a store now, I get overwhelmed, anxiety. Hey, I get it. The beautiful thing about that is you can do online arbitrage. So you can order it directly to your house and you can prep it and send it off to Amazon or store it locally and sell it on Amazon. Or you can order it online from a store and send it to your third party prep company, which is located in a tax free state. So now you're saving sales tax. I pay almost 10% sales tax where I live. So if I buy something that's a hundred and ship it to myself, it's 110. But if I ship it to my prep center, which is in a tax free state, I save 10 bucks. And then they only charge me $2 an item to get it packaged and shipped into Amazon. So in that way, you can do business by just using tools and shopping online on your computer in the comfort of your house and your pajamas and never having to see anyone. And I want you guys to realize that none of this is a get rich quick scheme. This is a for sure way to make money. And most people can make a good side income doing this, but it's not just going to work every time. If you're not determined to figure out why your mistakes happened and learn from them and get better. And you just think it's just like some casual that you don't have to pay attention to. It's not for you. When some people might think they need to do a quarter million a year to feel happy or feel good, other people just wanna make an extra 500 bucks a month, a couple thousand bucks a month. Everybody's different. The opportunity is there for everybody. Ashlyn says, should I get an LLC if I'm selling 5,000 a month because I don't wanna pay sales taxes that smart? I'm not actually sure if you need to have the LLC to not pay sales tax because you can be a sole proprietor and have a DBA, which is doing business as, or also known as FBN, fictitious business name. It's different in every state though. This is where it gets a little tricky. So go to your state gov website, whatever it is, it's gonna be .gov, and they'll have resources for you. Their website will look like it was made in 1995 most likely, and it will be terrible. So your best bet, in my opinion, get on the phone 
and call them during business hours and there's someone on the other end of that phone whose job is to field those phone calls and walk you through and help you get it done. They'll tell you exactly what form you need to fill out and how to set up all the business stuff that you need done for your needs specifically. They're there for you. A lot of you might not know that the bigger you go on Amazon, like as far as you're doing wholesale or private label and you're doing a million a month, 20 million a year, whatever, the smaller your margin gets. It might be 10% profit after paying your own salary. If it's 20, especially if it's 20 plus, you are killing it and doing better than most people in your business. Retail arbitrage and online arbitrage, you can regularly whoop those numbers, but doing wholesale and private label, you're not really gonna do much better than that. And that 10% sales tax, that could be your whole margin. Or just think about it as like, if we're both competing and you paid 110 and I only paid 100, I can sell it for $10 less than you and make the same amount of money, right? So maybe I'm breaking even and getting rid of the product, but now you either have to wait till I'm done selling it or sell it for less than me or match my price and you're losing $10 a unit, if not more. What quantity per product should you buy? I can't answer that question because it depends on the product. You need to understand the sales rank or the BSR of each item that you're looking at on Keepa, which is 20 bucks a month, and go back and look and see. Each time that spike drops on the Keepa chart, that's a sale, at least one. Really popular items, like the best-selling toothbrush or the best-selling pair of shoes, each spike is more than one sell. But on things that sell like only 30 units a month or so, each spike is probably about one sale. And you also know what price it's sold at because most people buy the buy box offer, which is they just go to Amazon and press buy. Also, anybody who can give you that answer, you shouldn't trust that person. There's no what quantity per product should you buy. I can give you a tip that's not really the answer, but it's similar. So when I do online arbitrage, I don't like to buy less than 10. Unless it's a very expensive item where the per unit profit is more, I don't wanna buy stuff that I can't buy at least 10. That means I expect to sell it in at least three months at the max and I wanna be able to buy 10, that's 3.3 units sold a month. Preferably, I'd rather have it sell in 30 to 60 days, but everything doesn't work out as you planned. My worst case scenario is 90, and if only 10 sell in that time period, I can't buy 10 because someone else might be selling it. You have to plan for it, but the reason I like to buy 10, besides the fact that you do one work one time, right, is it makes the accounting easier. You have to keep a spreadsheet and track all the things that you purchased and where you purchased them from and how much you paid and what your expected profit is and what the ASIN is so that when it shows up, you can just click on that and list it on Amazon and not have to go and look on Amazon for it again. James says, if you don't have the professional account, isn't it hard to get the buy box? So it is a little bit harder to get the buy box. So, but if you don't have a professional account, you can still do FBA and if you are appropriately priced in your FBA, in most categories, you will get the buy box. Now in some categories, they do make you earn it, but in most categories, if you are FBA, which means fulfilled by Amazon and at the warehouse and you're priced appropriately, you will get the buy box. Should I be worried about IP claims? I watched a video and it has me spooked to list anything I find in the store. Great one. So you should not be worried about IP claims. Just make sure that you're buying authentic merchandise from authentic places. And what will happen is occasionally a company will send you a warning and 75% of that time, that's probably your competitor trying to scare you off a listing, pretending to be the brand owner. So you have to kind of be a detective and look at these messages and see so if amazon sends you hey ip alert and it's like official it's from amazon but you might just get a message and sometimes you might be able to talk with the brand owner and figure it out that way and get approved or they're just trying to make sure that people are not selling counterfeit stuff that aren't selling for lower than they want them to sell you might ask them hey what's the problem i got these from an official place i like your product i'm interested in selling it but it's never going to be anything that has you super worried. So here's a good way to tell you're gonna get an IP claim almost certainly. When you find a really good product and then you go and look and you're like, damn, there's only one competitor and it's a really good product, chances are they're gonna file an IP claim because why is there only one competitor? You didn't just get super lucky. You know what I mean? Other people would have been on that product already.
And especially if that one person who's selling on the listing store name is the brand name or looks like the brand name, that's probably the brand owner and they're not letting anybody sell on there. So do not list on there in that situation. Or if you do only list like one or two, just take it slow. Don't go and buy a truckload of something because you're going to find out that it's probably going to bring you some trouble. But most of the time it's nothing. And even when it is something, it's just, okay, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. We'll take the listing down. It's not a big deal. Steven Lambert says, do you ever drop ship from online like Walmart or Kohl's, or do you always get the physical product and ship yourself? Personally, I don't like to drop ship because there's always the chance that by the time you sold the item and you see the sale and you go to fulfill it, or even if it's automated, the software can mess up and then there's no units in stock. And guess what? If you have to cancel enough orders on any platform because you can't get the unit for sale, you can lose your account. The other side is that if you are about it and you find yourself in a situation where you sold an item or multiple items and you can't get them from your regular supplier, you might consider buying them from another supplier, even at a price that might lose you money because at least you'll be able to fulfill that order and keep your order defect ratio low on that platform. Because like I said, if your ODR order defect ratio gets too high, you'll lose your account. And some platforms like Amazon are damn near impossible to make a second account. You basically need another human. Don't bite the hand that feeds you, right? By not being able to fulfill orders. There's a little hack to that. And that is called the store pickup drop shipping technique. I, that's not actually what it's called, but it does describe it. I like to make up my own technique names. So this is how it works. When you have a product that's really hot and you just know because it's sold out on target.com, but at your target, there's nine. What you could do is list it. And then if it sells, go to target and hope it's still there and you get it and ship it out to your customer. But what's better than that is buying from your store online for store pickup, preferably one unit at a time. The beautiful thing about store pickup is it doesn't charge you until you pick it up. So if you never show up and pick it up, you never pay for the item, but it was gathered, taken off the floor and held for you at customer service, which means if you do sell it, then you go pick that sucker up and get charged and ship it out to your customer. So yes, you get charged, but you've already secured the bag on the platform selling it and then ship it out to your customer. Hey bro, thanks for your content and info you provide for us. I'm doing online arbitrage for six months and it's so time consuming to search items. Is wholesale easier? less profit, longer time I can sell, right? Yes, correct. So you understand it pretty much exactly in the least amount of words possible. Wholesale is actually gonna make you less profit per unit, but your time that you spend finding those items and developing relations with your supplier is an investment and can create a lot of profit down the road. And the time, each product, you know what I mean? You can sell that again and again and again. Maybe after three months, it's not profitable anymore for you not selling it. But then maybe six months later, it becomes profitable again because in wholesale, you're constantly analyzing large lists of products that you made to potentially purchase, which is here's everything we've ever purchased. Should we reorder it or no? Should we liquidate it? Okay, but now these ones are ones you can still buy, which includes these ones that weren't good last time, but are good now. And that's kind of basically how wholesale works. You're still using things like tactical arbitrage to scan catalogs. You can manually go through catalogs for companies that don't have digital. That could be a gold mine. You could use your camera to make optical character recognition to make spreadsheets. It might not be perfect. You could take pictures of the pages and have virtual assistants in other countries do that for you, right? Probably AI can do it for you, but you're still going to be calling and calling and emailing and going to trade shows and meeting and setting up relations. But the good thing is, is that after two years of hard work busting your ass for your wholesale business, you might be able to quit your job and have a fairly nice system going on. The difference with the wholesale and the arbitrage is that arbitrage can make you a lot of money in a short period of time. Most of you, if you're focused and bust your ass, can quit you know, a six-figure job and make more doing online arbitrage or retail arbitrage or even selling used clothing or used junk from yard sales on eBay in three months definitely in six months. And most people will barely be making like a hundred thousand, if not 
more profit after two years of busting their ass with wholesale. In wholesale specifically, you might also have a warehouse and a forklift, at least like a thousand square foot warehouse or a very large storage unit or something, right? What is better for beginners, FBA or FBM? FBM, which stands for Fulfilled by Merchant. And the reason is, guys, is because when it's at your house, you have much more control over the inventory. It's about to become a lot more expensive to remove something from Amazon's platform. It might be as much as 10 or $12 to remove an item from Amazon's platform once you send it there. Read the emails that you get from Amazon, read the terms of service. I don't think it's gonna be that price forever, but if you've been on Amazon for a while, you know they change things. Goes up, goes down. They're trying to figure out how to not have their systems packed up with stuff that's not selling. So they adjust the rules all the time. Do FBM before you get into FBA. Some of you guys are the type that like to just dive headed in and maybe it'll be all right for you. But I'm telling you right now, when those fees start hitting you and you didn't expect them, don't be surprised. Just do FBM, get it dialed in and then go to FBA. It'll be much better for you. Okay, here's a good one. I went to ASD to meet with many wholesalers. Then they sent me the price catalog. Almost all of them were useless because prices were almost the same with Amazon. So here's the thing. You need to develop relations and get bulk discounts. The price in the catalog is not necessarily the price of what you have to pay. You can negotiate. But if you're not buying a lot, it's not really going to matter to you. If you find one in a thousand or one in 10,000 units that you go through that's worth trying, that still might be considered good in wholesale. There is millions and millions and millions, hundreds of millions of products you could sell on Amazon, and not very many of them are gonna be worth your time. So don't expect to find more than one out of a thousand items that you look up, or one out of five to 10,000 items even, because that could be the one that literally paves your way but you won't know until you find it and that's also why you need to be using software to go through everything so one trick that i learned from watch me amazon when i did an interview with him is he said he likes to make two purchase orders for his suppliers so it's like hey this is my purchase order i'm ready to make but if you can give me five percent off this is my purchase order I'm ready to make. And that might be a crazy difference in orders. One order might be a few thousand dollars or a thousand dollars. The other one might be three to five times more. And when you're the person who's dealing with the new customers placing their orders and you see that, these people have leeway, right? That's why you can negotiate, but this is a very powerful negotiating tactic. A good tip that I can give you is to look at local suppliers near you. Look at anybody around you that makes anything and get in touch with them and just go see what they got, get their catalog, meet them, talk to them. You might be surprised at what you find because I can tell you that it's not a trade show made for Amazon sellers. So those people likely haven't met with any other Amazon sellers. Just go to Google and type wholesaler or distributor plus your city name and just start going through and looking at them, call them, drive by. There's gonna be gold mines in there, trust me. Zacharias says, hey bro, pretty new to the game. Question, has there been anything in the past couple years that has been outdated and or is just not worth doing anymore? Toys and electronics still profitable? Yes, hugely profitable. The most common misconception is that everybody thinks it's too late to get started, but guess what? It's not, it's never too late. There's always new opportunities on the internet. And if you just apply yourself, you will find stuff. And the sad truth is, guys, if a thousand of you start selling after one year and maybe after two years, I'd be very surprised if 10 of you were still selling. And maybe only one of you would be making a full-time living off of it. If you figure out how to sustain yourself or your family and make a living on the internet after two years of doing it full-time, you're probably got clear skies ahead of you and you're about to make it to five years. Assuming that you don't have a black swan event like the pandemic hit, you'll probably make it to 10 years too. Most people I know that make it and are still doing it for a long time are just creative hustlers and they're always gonna figure out a new something. They might not be doing the same exact thing the same way forever, but they're always gonna find something. Golden State Picker says, what about liquidation through Amazon to get rid of items? Yes, definitely is a good option overpaying the overpriced return fees which is going to be going up really shortly if they haven't gone up is to do the liquidation option so at least you get something and you can get rid of it when you're sourcing products at retail stores how do you know that they're actually selling that they're already profitable so this is a great question so 
the way you know that something's actually selling when you find it at a retail store is because of this special number called sales rank on Amazon or best sellers rank. Every item on Amazon in every category has a number assigned to it. If it's number one, it's the best selling item on the entire platform. When things don't sell on Amazon, that number gets higher and higher and higher. It gets worse. And then when it sells, it shoots down lower. It creates downward pressure. It doesn't go all the way back to one. It goes back to where it fits in the algorithm of all of the other products selling in its category. Download the Amazon seller app. Once you're a seller, you get the Amazon seller app. You scan the barcode. You can see the sales rank. You can see the category. And if you know this information, you can get from Keepa.com slash number sign exclamation category tree. It shows you how many items are in the category. You can do some simple math and figure out what the top percentage is. Now that's free, but what's better is if you pay for Keepa, which is like $20 a month, you can see a graph for every single product listed on Amazon and there will be a green line for the sales rank. And when that thing goes up and down like an earthquake, each spike down is a sale, at least one sale. And then you can set that to show 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. You could stretch it out to the beginning of recorded data for that product. Underneath it, you could also see the frequency and the supply of products. So you'll see that there was 100 units listed this day or this month. Then you can see the price of the various offers that were on Amazon when the spike happened. And 99% of the time, the buy box price, which is the new item, at FBA or the best item for the customer, which gets the buy box is going to be the price it's sold at. If you know the sales rank, you know how well it's selling. And for the same place, Keepa.com, you can see how much it's selling for. Now, if you don't have access to see the Keepa chart, you can just guess based on the sales rank per how many items are in the category. And you can learn from that and become accustomed to that, right? You can go to my website, ReasyResells.com. And on the drop down on the top, there's a thing for a sales rank chart. It's completely free. I don't email you anything but that. So every month you'll get an email, say, hey, here's your updated sales rank chart. And you can screenshot that and put it on your phone lock screen or just have it in your camera roll and favorite or whatever. And it will tell you this is the top 10% in these categories. This is the top 1%. So if it's in the top 1% and it also has a lot of 4.5 star reviews, maybe it's going to be good and you can take a chance on it. Time to leave says, what would you buy if you had only a thousand in credit and you wanted to kill it on Amazon? Where would you start? To be honest, I would start with used stuff. I would do retail arbitrage for very awesome deals. And if you only have a thousand bucks, you got to be very particular about the items that you buy because you want to turn your capital over very quickly. It'd be very easy for me to go spend a thousand dollars right now on shoes. I would spend all my money in one shopping trip and then what? I would have to wait for everything to sell. In order for that strategy to work well for you, you need to focus on buying quick turning items like very quick. You need to focus on your sell through rate and just converting as fast as possible, which means you're going to be skipping on items. The less money that you have, the more aggressive you need to be with your pricing and the more conservative you need to be with your buying. You're going to have to be passing on the slower moving profit. And as you get more capital, you'll either be able to buy more of stuff that sells faster or you'll be able to buy that stuff that sells a little bit slower, which means you'll be able to get more inventory. But as soon as you run out of money, if you're not buying, you're dying. That's kind of the name of the game with selling on Amazon, no matter how you're doing it, depending on how quickly you want to change your circumstances, maybe you'd be okay with doing, having less of a quicker return and more of a long-term return. So either waiting or investing your time into learning something like how to do minor graphic design for print on demand, either through Etsy with Printful and Redbubble or signing up for merch on demand with Amazon and just making t-shirts and selling those t-shirts and other various items. If you got any value, Hit the like button, subscribe to uh, my podcast channel below. I'm trying to get me a second silver plaque. All right, guys, have a good night. Uh, remember, if you ain't flipping, you slipping. Peace. Follow now.